Okay, thank you, Harald. So, um, contracts in C20. Um, for those of you who don't know me since before, I'm Bjorn Faller. I've been doing C since um, forever. Uh, apologize in advance. Um, I have a cold. My voice is not the best. I hope it will last the entire session. We'll see. Contracts. I thought this thing would work. It decided not to. Oh well. Of course things fail. All right. So, what's a contract? Here's what uh, Miriam Webster's dictionary says. Binding agreement between two or more persons or parties, especially one legally enforceable. All right? A business arrangement for the supply of goods or services at a fixed price. Maybe not that one. The act of marriage or agreement to marry. No, I think we can skip that one. Um, a document describing the terms of a contract. Like, have you signed the contract yet? Uh, we're getting there. The final bid to win a specified number of tricks in bridge. Any bridge players here? That is sort of similar, sort of. An order arrangement for a hired assassin to kill someone. We will actually go back to that one. <laughs> we will. Um, in software design, stupid thing. It's a formalized agreement regarding uh, program correctness between a user and the implementation of a component. And uh, the important bit here is regarding program correctness. Um, failure to fulfill a contract is a bug. Period. End of discussion. So, um, I learned about design by, pro by contract. I prefer to call it that uh, because it's a, an interface design principle from this book. Object-Oriented Software Construction by Burton Meyer. Uh, this was uh, course literature in a course on object-oriented software in 92, I think. It's been some, a few years. Um, 92 was the golden age of uh, object orientation. That wasn't a problem in the world that could not be solved by object orientation. Um, I actually don't really remember what what I thought about object orientation from that course. But what I do remember is this, uh, chapter seven. Systematic approaches to program construction. The notion of assertion, preconditions, postconditions, class invariance. For me, that was an eye opener. Uh, it was like I, I had never thought that you could think about designing software in, in that way. So I've been using contracts a fair bit. Now, contracts aren't a panacea that will solve all your problems, but they're not unimportant. They can really help. So let's dive into this. I, I will begin with uh, an introduction to what we mean with, with, uh, with the design. And as an example, I'm, I'm using a ring buffer. Not very long ago, I talked to a, a, a trainer who said he used a ring buffer as an example in a class, and uh, like nine tenths of his students had no idea what a ring buffer is. So I figured I should probably show it very briefly. So a ring buffer is a, a queue of a fixed size. So we have one here, uh, a ring buffer of 12 integers. It's currently empty. You can push a value into it, another one, yet one pop something off from it, push some values pop. You, you, you get the idea, and it, it just goes round and round and round. Uh, but the big thing is that it's fixed size. So I'm going to use this uh, as an example for introducing the idea of contracts, and then after, after having given the idea what we mean, uh, the reason I'm doing this, uh, this first intro is 
because I, I, in my experience there are I'm guessing about half of you are familiar with it and half of you are not so th those of you who are familiar with it you can set the clock on snooze for 15 minutes roughly so this ring buffer class we can look at the contracts. I mentioned that there are preconditions, postconditions, and uh, class invariants primarily. And a precondition is an obligation that the caller must fulfill for the program to be correct. If a user of a component, in this case a user of the ring buffer, does something outside the contract, they're doing something illegal. They are at fault. So precondition typically refers to the input parameters or the, uh, the state of the object or, or a combination of them. So let's go through them. The default constructor, uh, what, what preconditions can we think about for a default constructor? Any suggestions? Available. Available. As a precondition, no. Uh, available memory. Available memory. Yeah, it's. Uh, I would say no, not not available memory. Um, but it, it's. Uh, you could you could have that. You could have that as a precondition. Yeah. Positive number for n. Positive number for n. That is not a precondition for the for the constructor of the ring buffer because you you cannot instantiate the type with a negative number, shouldn't be able to. Uh, that is also a matter of the type. I'm talking about the uh, ability to, to actually construct the object. I'm not talking about the uh, possibility to compile the code. So that is, but uh, actually it's very good that you mentioned this because the, the contracts are about runtime properties. They are not about compile time at all. For, for compile time, guarantees we have things like concepts coming that's a completely different talk um, actually i would say you almost never ever have any precondition on a default constructor almost never um, because typically the precondition is on uh, the parameters but you don't have any parameters or the state of the of the object but before you have constructed it there is no state so you cannot say it. An exception I can think of is, for example, a singleton. You can say that a precondition is that it doesn't exist, but then you really should avoid singletons to begin with. So, uh, but there are exceptions, but, but typically I would say you don't. What about the size? Is that reports uh, how many elements we have in the ring buffer? Do we have preconditions on that one? Something about parameters, they are known. State. Object needs to exist. Object needs to exist. Yeah, that, that, is, that is true, but kind of nonsensical, because if it doesn't exist, you cannot call size on it. You, you don't have anything to call size on. If placement disrupted, then it still exists, but invalid. No, it actually, no, 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 no. If you have placement destructed it, or explicitly called the destructor, then your object per definition does not exist. You're calling something through an invalid reference. You have undefined behavior. Because you're calling a function on a nothing. Language lawyer hat on. <laughs> Arvid. That your class invariant is satisfied. That the class invariant is satisfied. Yes, skip um, 30 slides. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. That is true. Uh, actually, I would say for this kind of function, something that really just reports a state, you typically don't have preconditions on it. You might, but, but you typically don't. Push them, something to enter new values into the ring buffer. Now things get interesting. Enough space for the new Enough space, yeah. It, it's a fixed size one that the ring buffer isn't full. Yeah, that's one. We actually have a choice here. Because we can also choose to define the behavior. Say that uh, it's uh, throwing an exception, or uh, if it's uh, 
a re-entrant queue from several threads we, we could block until someone has popped something. That is also a possibility. Uh, since this is not a talk about multi-threading, but one about um, contracts, I will choose to say that it is a contract, that it mustn't be full. So we can just say that it, we have a requirement before making the call that the size must be less than n, strictly, because otherwise the client has done something wrong. This is a choice I have made. Other choices can be made. Uh, I have a question. Yes? If uh, it's about to throw error when it's full, uh, is it legal to call it just to check if someone else? Ah, is it legal to violate a contract to see if you are in violation of the contract? Yeah. Uh, I think criminal law works that way. You try to commit a crime, and if you go to jail, it was illegal. <laughs> um, don't, don't do that. Do, do not try to violate a contract to find out if, if it is violated or not. Don't. Just don't. It's actually about the contract. If you check the size and you push, you don't If I check the size and I push, I have a problem. If, if, uh, if I have a, if I allow a multi-threaded access, yes. That is absolutely true. So it's a, it's a design choice. So if, if you want to have a, a, like a message queue, for example, implemented like this, then it affects the, the design choice of the interface. In this case, I'm choosing a, a simplistic single-threaded one. Uh, would you say that protection against concurrent access should be a precondition? Like the fact that there is not someone else trying to push at the same time? Should protection against concurrent access be a precondition? I would say no, because you cannot really do that. You, you cannot guard against it in, in, in this way. Because what you're saying is that the caller must know that they are, are not in violation of the contract when they make the call. You can have a mutex outside. Yeah, sure, you, you can do such a construction. Um, I think I would advise against, but yeah, you can. So then I would say that the precondition is that the mutex is taken by you, the current caller, or something like that. All right. Pop. Get, a, get the oldest value from the ring buffer. Do you have any preconditions on that one? Not empty, yeah. But again, we have a choice. Like if we wanted it to be a multi-threaded thing, then we could do differently, or we could choose to throw an exception. But yeah, that, that is a reasonable one, and that is the one I have chosen for this presentation. Post conditions, then. Post condition is the guarantee from the implementation regarding the effect of the call, provided the call is is legal, that it is in contract. Because if someone has made a call outside of contract, then the implementation is not bound by the contract because suit yourself. If, if, if you're the, the contract is already violated, so who cares? And post conditions usually refer to return value or a new state. Uh, that can be dependent, so we have uh, also d dependency on the parameter value. So say if, if this, this value in this state, then we should have that state and some other value. So post conditions are a little bit more tricky to express, I think. So post condition on the default constructor. Someone said it earlier. Can it be possible to destruct and assign? It should be possible to destruct and assign, yes. That is a good one. Actually, it's, a, it's kind of super mean to have a default constructor and you cannot destroy it after. That, that, is, that is super nasty. Um, but it, yeah, it's, it's a valid one. Not sure. 
Size is zero, that makes perfect sense. Uh, any other takers? It, it, yeah, the, it's a valid empty ring buffer, yeah. So that is what I say. It, it, we, the default constructor ensures that the buffer is empty. Post conditions on size. Hold on. No, because you don't have an object. So uh, to repeat the question, it's can you call size before uh, the uh, constructor? No, you cannot. Uh, yeah, but it, yes, so yeah, so the, uh, the observation is you cannot call size from inside the constructor bef because the object formally doesn't exist until you have exited the constructor. And that is true. Uh, this is not a... a a problem regarding the post condition because the post condition logically happens after the construction is, has run to completion. So that is okay. Yeah, it's, it shouldn't change the state of the object. Should not. That is an excellent one. I forgot that. Actually, it's sort of implied since it's a const, const function, but yeah. The return value should be the size. Yeah. The it's a. Uh, I would say that it, it, you don't bother. It's not worth it. But, but you can. You can say, for example, that whatever it returns is between zero and end. Or if you're completely crazy, you can say it's the difference between number of legal pushes and pops. But it, that. Okay. Can you say that it's, uh, the, the return value is the number of elements in the. How do you express that? Because that is the actual definition of what size is. It's the number of uh, elements in the buffer. So, so it's not so complete. The post conditions are not complete description. Uh, <coughs> correct. So, so the, the, the observation is that, that a post condition is not a complete description of the functionality here. And it's not. Uh, it's, a, it's a partial bit of what must be done. It's a, Yes, Simon. Sorry, can. Above or equal to zero. Above or equal to zero, yeah. Or uh, between zero and n inclusively. But I don't think it makes. Uh, I don't think it's worth it to, to express that um, personally, but you can. Yes, it must be. Well, must it be something you can test? No, it, it doesn't really have to be. But how valuable is it if you can't test it? Um, I mean, as documentation. As documentation, it, 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 sure. We, we will get back to that, actually. We will get back to that. Um, OK, uh, accidental click there, push. Uh, Post condition, it's, it makes sense to say that it, it has grown by one. Size must be one bigger than it was. Can we say something more about post condition? If you call pop size times, it will return the element that you call it with. If I call pop size times, I get the element. Yeah. I would say don't go there, but you can say that. <laughs> you can say that. Um, however, what we can do, uh, sorry. Um, I, I would like post conditions uh, would be, be that the copy of the input value would be inside the ring buffer. Yes. So that is actually what I propose to say that we, we add a new function, say, so give me the top element. And after the call to push, then the top element must be the one that we had as a parameter. That, I think that makes sense. So it's, it's not a complete description, but it's something. It's a, it's a sanity check. We, we haven't messed up completely. Oh, does the post condition uh, 
applied to the value of the parameter when, since, since the implementation is free to modify it. <coughs> You're way ahead of me. We will get back to that. C currently, we can say that we assume some divine view from above of, of the uh, of the user, and we, we're not bothered with how it's implemented. So we look at the value as it was at the time of the call. But we will get back to that one. It's an excellent question. So we add a new function top, and of course we require that uh, it must not be empty when we call top uh, as a precondition. What if an exception is thrown? That is super nasty. Um, Just forbid exceptions and everything is solved, then it, then it works. Yeah, that, that is a, yeah, sure. Well, it could be exception state, uh, and nothing will happen if uh, an exception is thrown. It would be, be in the same state before you. Yeah, you, so the observation is you can have the, the strong exception guarantee. You say that if an exception is thrown, then nothing has happened. Everything is as it used to be. Uh, and that is what we want. That, that is the ideal. It's not always possible because see, if you think generally it can be a function that has observable side effects of so sending a message across a network and then if an exception is thrown, we cannot unsend it. <laughs> it has gone away. What can we do? Uh, from a contract's point of view, the, the, the typical idea is that post conditions handles returns. And if you threw, you didn't actually return. So it doesn't say anything about the post condition. So there, there is no post condition to worry about in, in, in that case. There are other things that, that matters, but not post conditions. Pop them, post conditions. I think you can see that one. We, we want the size to have shrunk by one. And maybe we, we want to be able to observe what we get. So we can introduce a, a function bottom as opposed to top that gives the oldest element. And we can say that what we get is what bottom was before we made the call. This terminology is actually the one used by Bertrand Meyer in, uh, in his book about uh, object orientation. Uh, so this is a terminology I learned way back when. Uh, yeah, and of course a precondition on bottom. And it doesn't make sense to try to express the whole functionality in terms of the contract, because the, that, that way lies madness. You, you, you give some, you provide some guarantees, something that must be true, something that is testable, that is true. Uh, and otherwise you're sort of implementing the entire function in contract. You don't actually need an implementation. That is weird. So don't do that. Okay, class invariants. So a class invariant is something that is always true for an instance. From the moment that it has completed the constructor until the moment it enters the destructor, it is always true. And it is, in my experience, super difficult to express good class invariants. And when I say always true, I mean always true when viewed from outside the interface. So, of course, it's perfectly all right for the implementation of a function to, to violate the invariant while it executes, as long as, it's, as long as the invariant is restored when you return. Or if you're calling callbacks, then you're leaving the execution of, uh, of the implementation, then it must also be true, because it can be called back. Multi-threading, Multi -threading, yes. And especially if you have a, a, a lock-free implementation, then you can say that, yeah, th then the invariant must always, always, always be true, because everything can happen at any time. You must never violate it, even for the half an instruction. Um, which is actually the reason that uh, lock-free programming is 
super duper difficult because you must ensure that the invariant holds at every single time, always. And in the case of exceptions, you're not free from uh, upholding the class invariant. That must hold true. The, the post, post condition is not worth anything in the case of, of an exception, but the class invariant must still be true. And uh, seriously, that is the only uh, class invariant I can think of that makes sense from an interface perspective. You may note that I haven't looked at how to implement this at all. This is just from a purely abstract point of view of what a, a ring buffer is. Depending on choice of implementation, we may get different things, but, but without reasoning about how it's implemented, I, I think this is the only thing we can say, that this, the size is somewhere between 0 and n. Would you say that being destructible is a class invariant? In regard, for example, if, if you had a function that is not exception safe at all, I'm not saying you should, but if you have a function that is not even simple uh, exception yeah. safe, would you say that the fact that it's always destructible is an invariant? Or would I say what I say that is destructible is an invariant, yes, but how can you police it? How, how can you ensure that, how can you have some kind of test, some condition to say that, yes, this is destructible? Um, uh, assert not crash, yeah. yeah. <laughs> assert not crash, yeah. So, so what you do is you fork, you try to run it, and if it didn't core dump, then it was good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, class invariants are super difficult. Uh, it's easy to write one, but write one that is correct and makes sense. That is uh, so hard. And another one. This is C plus plus. What about move semantics? What's uh, what's, a, what's the invariant for a, a moved from object? It must be uh, yeah. Uh, the, the, that is pretty much it. The the, the the invariant is that it must always be destructible as a minimum and it preferably should be assignable and that is sort of a meaningless uh, invariant. So I think for, for classes that support move semantics, invariants don't make sense at all. And that was that. Templates. This is a template. What about a specialization? If I make a, ring, a partial specialization for pointer types, what can I do then? Can I change my contracts for a specialization? Mathieu is really frowning here in, at the front row. Maybe I can strengthen them up. But is that fair to uh, um, some generic template code that doesn't know what its T is? It just knows that it, it manages a ring buffer of T's. Is it fair to say that different rules apply depending on what the T is? I don't think so, personally. You can do it often. So, sorry? You can loosen them. No, 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 no. Don't, don't go there. Again, uh, the, the, say that you're loosening. You, you can, yeah, sure. You, you can loosen a precondition, but don't loosen a postcondition. Then you're really evil. Yeah, but so, a, a precondition you can, yes. You can have a postcondition. I can have a postcondition. Post post add a postcondition. Yes, Provide, provided that they are sort of completely orthogonal, that doesn't in any way interact with the existing ones. So this is a difficult one. This is a tricky one. Inheritance. So now all these are virtual functions. They're pure virtual. What should, what should different implementations do? Same thing, yeah. What, 
What Bertrand Meyer says is that, th this is actually his uh, terminology, it's, uh, he calls the implementation a, a subcontractor, which sort of makes sense. So we can say that a subcontractor can have more relaxed preconditions because every call that is made through this interface does comply. And someone who has knowledge about the concrete type can take advantage of the known relaxed preconditions. No, I, is, is this the same thing for, as for specializations? I don't think so. You could see, for example, like, like if, if, if the, Yeah, it, it, it is true. In, yes, it is true in the sense that you, yeah, you can have a more relaxed precondition. Yeah, that is true. I, I agree. Uh, yeah, well, if you if you have more relaxed preconditions, that is okay. If you have things that are completely orthogonal, but if you add something that is in violation with the, the no, sure. base, then it's bad, really bad. Uh, and you can have stricter post conditions for, for the same reason, because a stricter post condition is in compliance with, with the one from the interface. But why bother? Because it's good, yeah. Uh, because it can make your interfaces clearer. You, you express what you expect to some degree. Not, not everything, it's not a full specification, but to some degree. And it can actually make debugging easier. Because this is the detective story. We have your private investigator here. And who's at fault? Well, it's elementary. If a precondition is violated, Who's the guilty party? Clients. It's a client. We have a bug in the client. There are no ifs and buts. If a post condition is violated, provided that the precondition was not, the then the implementation is at fault. And the invariant, it's the implementation. Or possibly you have a really bad contract. And that, that is it. I mean, you can express as a contract that the next call to random must be four, but uh, that is a super bad contract. <laughs> uh, like the ring buffer is a container. Uh, if the bug is in the contain type, or the type that you contain, would you say that it's a client bug? If the yes. Okay. Given that the, this ring buffer example, it, it's, a, it's a container of T's. If the bug is in T, yeah, the, the, it's, it, it's a, a client that has instantiated with a T and the T was somehow in violation of a contract, then it's a T that is at fault, yes. Uh, in this example, there were really no uh, contracts at all on T, but, but you could have such. Uh, so, for example, you could say that even if you're not expressively saying that the copy constructor must be a no throw copy constructor with a compile time guarantee, you can still say that it's a condition that it must not throw. And then the T is at fault, or rather the, the user of the ring buffer is at fault for instantiating it with a type that is not in compliance with the contract. <coughs> so that's one thing. I think it's it's really powerful. It, it makes the interfaces clearer. It makes it much easier to, to reason about where a bug is instead of trying to think that, okay, we, we had this really weird behavior or this crash, who, who is at fault? Here we have it defined it quite strictly. Okay, C plus 20. Contracts are coming as a language feature in C++20. You probably noticed that all my contracts were just comments. This took time to draw. This is uh, the standard as it looked uh, some day between uh, Christmas and New Year's Eve. One rectangle for every page. The green ones mention contracts one way or the other. 
the first line is just a table of contacts. Uh, the last few lines are uh, indexes and such like. Uh, so it's just a scattered few places. This is not a huge thing in the standard. So the, the main functional functionality is described in these four pages. There are really only four pages, truly. Uh, and then we have one page that uh, describes what happens when you violate contracts. One paragraph about virtual functions. And one sentence, a non-formative one to, to add about uh, templates. Not a lot. And the other dots are just references that don't really add any, uh, any information about contracts. So not a lot. This is not a big thing. So here it was, it says. Um, I'm referring a lot to the draft standard. Uh, I have uh, URLs uh, everywhere. They will probably become invalid as the document evolves, but for now this is true. Uh, if you didn't know, the eel.is, it's uh, actually the, the guy who is maintaining this site, is uh, named Elis. So now you know, now you can remember. So, contracts are expressed as attributes. Did any of you listen to last uh, CPP cast from last Friday with uh, Arthur O'Dwyer? Yes. yes. Did you notice what he said about contract attributes? <laughs> he said that contract attributes aren't actually attributes because they, they are not in... Uh, they're actually violating the rules for attributes. They just look like attributes if, you, if you're not a language lawyer or if you squint. Uh, so we have this attribute, pseudo attribute, expects, that is a precondition. So you can write it like, like this. You have a, a function, in this case, something that takes a unique pointer. And I say, it expects that p is not null pointer. So you have expects colon and a condition that must be possible to uh, evaluate to, to true or false. Are we in compliance with the contract or are we in violation? We have a contract level that we can optionally supply. So the default is, well, the default. So you don't have to write that, but maybe you want to, to be extra clear. Audit is sort of a, a stronger one. And Axiom is so strong that it's actually never checked. <laughs> <laughs> Axiom are meant to be used by tools like uh, uh, static analysis tools that can say that, yeah, you have, you have stated that this must be true. And even though we're never doing any runtime checking of it, I, I can see from my glorious uh, static analysis that you will be in violation of it, so don't go there. It could be used by IDEs. So we could say like this, uh, expect axiom P is not null pointer. This does not generate any code to check it. When is it checked? We'll get to, when is it checked? We'll get to that, we'll get to that. Post conditions are spelled in short. And you can write it like this. We have some function prev that expects a value greater than zero and ensures that the value is one less. And you can see on ensures that it has an identifier opt. And that is if the post condition refers to the returned value, we, we give the returned value a name locally for this expression. So in this case, ensures audit R. We say that in the expression that follows R means the returned value. And then we have 
an assert that is really just a generic assert. It's uh, very much the same thing as the assert macro, except that you can uh, say uh, at default or audit or axiom level. But you use it the same way as you use a, a, a normal assert. Like so, for example. Ensure that there are no null pointers in there. And there are no class invariants. It doesn't exist. There is no such thing. I don't know why, but I have a sneaky suspicion that it has something to do with things like what is the invariant of a moved from object? Or how do we ensure that the, that the invariant is not violated when we're leaving it because we're leaving the object because we're calling a callback? So those don't exist, sorry. All that talk about the value of um, invariants and no support in the language. Bummer. Can I sneak it in through the assert? Can I sneak it in through the assert? You, you can implement your own. You can implement your own handler of uh, invariants. Yeah, sure. I, I have done so without having any support for, for this in, for C++ classes for ages. So of course you can, but, but you don't have a direct language support for it. So let's go back to the ring buffer and uh, C++ 20 if I it. So the invariant, well, there is no support. So we might just well just leave it as a comment, say that the, this must hold. Post condition. Yeah, we saw those uh, as uh, attributes, so uh, that is easy, except bummer. The problem is that these are uh, declarations that can only refer to what has been seen. They cannot look forward in the, uh, the lexical analysis phase. So to be able to refer to size, it, size must have been seen. So we, we have to rearrange things a bit. Not a biggie, but a bit inconvenient. Henrik? Is that true in template code? Um, I don't know. I mean, this is template code, uh, but it depends on how it is, uh, it is used, uh, I think. Um, I don't know is the answer. That uh, the compilation error message I, I showed you is from this exact code and that is a template. So, uh, Precondition, well, that is an expects attribute, pseudo attribute. Uh, the precondition, again, it's the same. Push the precondition, nothing new there, new there. Insurance, this one is tricky because there is absolutely no way whatsoever to refer to how something was before we made a call. We're missing something here. So this cannot be expressed. There's absolutely no way to do this. So what we can say is something more relaxed. Yeah, well, if it grew by one, then at least it's not zero, that, that we do know. You can say as a comment that it's incremented, but uh, I, I find this quite unsatisfying, but what can you do? And this one, top is T. Okay, so to begin with, we have two post conditions. If a function has multiple post conditions, Preconditions, their value, evaluation, if any, will be performed in the order they appear. Okay, good. If a function has multiple post conditions, their evaluation, if any, will be performed in the order they appear. Okay, good. So, so far, so good. But the value then, if a post condition ODR uses the parameters in its predicate and the function body makes a direct or indirect modification of the value that parameter, of that parameter, the value is. Uh, the behavior is undefined. That was the question. What happens if the implementation 
makes a change to the parameter value? Well, you be you. Sorry. <laughs> you can make your code, code more unsafe by. Yes, so you can make your code more unsafe by adding a contract. Yeah. Mark my word, there will be posts about this, very confused questions about this on Stack Overflow. <laughs> I guarantee it. What's the scoping rules? Could you introduce the local variable in the body and then use it in the condition? Can I introduce a local variable in the uh, function body and refer to it in the post condition? No, you cannot, because the post condition refers to what is visible from the from the interface. You cannot refer to an internal function in the function body in the, uh, in the post condition. But then you kind of ugly could implement a method to use in this way. You could extend your API to, to give you access to the data you are missing. I can extend my interface together. Yeah, sure, you can always extend your interface to make a change to your interface to, to sort of work around the rules. I mean, to, yeah. Yeah. Well. yeah, but I, in this case, I actually understand perfectly well why this is the rule. Because say, for example, I mean, the rule must apply generically. Say that in this case, it's not, um, it's not actually an int, but it's a unique pointer. What is the value of the unique pointer on the return that is moved from? And it, uh, you, you cannot retain the value because then by definition it's not unique. So I can understand why it is that way, but I think it's very unfortunate and I think there will be a lot of confusion caused by this. So yeah, that means that the, the validity of a post condition declaration depends on how the function is implemented. I'm not happy about this. I can see why it is the way it is, but I'm not happy about it. The obvious, obvious implementation of push would be a move from T, yeah. Which, uh, which, uh, which means that you're uh, in uh, undefined behavior land immediately, yes. So, yeah. This one will cause a lot of confusion. Have there been discussions about APIs that only... Yeah. Sorry, can you repeat again? I mean, you have like, the, the previous one where you wanted to check if the site is the previous site. Yeah. Well, you could implement a prep site memory method and then use that in the contract. Then you would like, want the prep site method to be only accessible by the contract. Oh, I understand. Wow, okay. <laughs> so the question was, have there been discussions about uh, creating s contract support functions that, that, uh, that are only callable from within a contract expression? None that I know of, but uh, hey, I haven't been on the meetings, so. <laughs> Would you? Um, yeah. But then I would need extra state, yes. Can the contract call a private method? Can a contract call a private method? I don't know. <laughs> that is an excellent question. I don't know. I have to look that up until the next time I do this presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Imatia. All right. So we can write that, but it's problematic. Oh. Oh. <laughs> um, I won't repeat all that, sorry. Write uh, the paper, Write uh, the paper. 
Yeah, I think that is uh, the correct response. Yeah, R write a paper that uh, writes the wrongs. Um, I'm telling it the, the way it is as I have learned it, um, good or bad, actually good and bad. Uh, this one, no surprise, same old, same old, and the same problem again. Since we cannot add it in any way refer to it like that, we, we, we may as well leave it. Virtual functions. It doesn't really say a heck of a lot. It says this. If an overriding function specified contract conditions, it shall specify the same list of contract conditions as, is, as its overridden functions. So even though technically we can have more relaxed preconditions and stricter postconditions, the, the language doesn't allow this. Which means that we can't. I mean, uh, from a philosophical point of view, we can, but in the language, we cannot. And also, it says, otherwise, it is considered to have the same list of contract conditions from, the, from one of its overridden functions, which to me implies that a good rule of thumb is only specify them in the base class, never specify them again, never in the implementation, never repeat them in overridden functions. I think. Yeah, so this is undefined behavior if you have different functions. Yeah, it, uh, sure. And uh, as far as I understand, it's undefined behavior if you deviate from it. So the, it's better to not just just not say anything at all. I think to just say, yeah, repeat what is in, in the base class. It's it's implied, so don't you don't have to say it. So that is a limitation. And function pointers. Well, it doesn't say a heck of a lot of, about function pointers in terms of uh, text mass, but it actually says super much. This small example says so very much. A function po pointer cannot include contract conditions. That is interesting. But at the same time, it's obviously, it says that, yeah, but you can assign a function pointer from a function that does have a contract or have contracts. That is okay. And if you call the function through the function pointer, then the contracts are checked. So two things here. Since Since the function pointer cannot have the, the, the contracts at all, it means that the contracts are not part of the signature, which means that we cannot have, if, if we have something that takes callbacks, we, we cannot impose contract obligations on the callback. I think that is a bummer. It would make sense. Yeah. Uh, in this example, um, well, neither, because we haven't, uh, so the question is, uh, since uh, integer overflow is undefined behavior, and if uh, this uh, example uh, function g is called with int max, is the client or the uh, implementation fault? Well, neither, because we haven't said that it's I illegal to call it with int max, but we have also not said that it is, is legal. So we have a, a deficiency in the contract here. It's, it's not strict enough. So you found a loophole in the legal document. And the second thing is that since, since a call through a function pointer that doesn't know anything about the contract, the, the contract is still checked. <coughs> this implies that the contract checking code must be inside the function. It is not done by the caller before making the call or after returning from the call. So that's what they call it axiomatic. You want to check by R2. 
the ax axiom contracts, uh, well, th since they aren't checked, they sort of don't matter. They, they aren't checked inside a function nor outside a function because they actually aren't checked at all, ever. But by the compiled code, that is. An external tool can check them. Yeah, uh, so the observation is that if, if you have a naked function pointer, you don't know what it refers to, and the, which means that you cannot know if you make the call in, in compliance or in violation of the contract. Yeah, that is true. Sorry. <laughs> but that is, that is a deficiency. I, yeah. yeah, but even if you fulfill all the preconditions, you're not guaranteed that it's a valid call, anyway. It's a subset. Even if I fulfill all the requirements, all the preconditions, yeah, sure, it's, it's, you, you cannot. I, I don't think it is uh, possible to always, for all functions, be able to express a, a watertight yeah. contract that, that can never be folded. Um, I, don't, I don't think that is possible. This is. It's a sanity check. Well, it, it's more than a sanity check, but, but it, it's not watertight. Yes, it's, it's not everything. Yes, the, the, the observation is that these are like assertions. Well, you can skip the word like. They are assertions. Uh, do they work for const expert? Uh, do they work for const expert? Um, I can only assume so. I don't actually know. Is that way to make, make a difference? Because uh, I. I can only assume that if you're, if you're calling a const expert function in const expert context in violation of the contract, then it must be a compilation failure. I cannot see anything else. But, but I actually don't know that for sure. Static assert, yeah. But that is provided that the, code, the, the function is evaluated in const expert context. If it's not, then it's still a runtime thing. But uh, th that is also something I must look up. I don't know. So thank you for that. Uh, yeah. So in other words, it's, it's a responsibility of the function implementation to enforce its contract. It's not the responsibility of the caller. Interesting. That is not the obvious choice, but it's the choice that is made. So let's explore. Uh, there is a fork from uh, Clang 6. I don't know why it's from Clang 6. Uh, that you can get from this uh, GitHub link if you want to. And they are hosting their own compiler explorer. The official compiler explorer doesn't have this branch. Since I don't trust the availability of networks when doing a presentation, I'm hosting my own. But you should be able to see what we have here. We have a ring buffer, we have the contracts. One thing I can say if you choose to play with this, this, this branch is quite fragile. It's very easy to get, get internal compiler error. Just so you know. So, some implementation stuff. This is not the most brilliant possible implementation, it's just a uh, an implementation that is easy to write. So I have a function here that is obviously in violation of the contract. So I'm just default constructing a ring buffer and then I call top. That is not allowed. At 01, which actually produces the easiest to read code for the contract. Um, we can see that f just calls the ring buffer constructor and it calls top. So there are no contract checks done in here. <laughs> Whereas the constructor does its uh, initialization, calls size, check if it's zero. If it's not, calls uh, lbb7 underscore two, which calls terminate. Yes, a hitman contract. 
we are assassinating our program. If you push the optimizer, would Clang just translate everything to a call to, uh, to terminate? So it's basically it's super easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I didn't. I didn't want to start at that level. <laughs> Too bad because like a study has was about it. Yeah, I'm. I'm a little bit surprised that you, you can see that it's uh, warning free. I, I. I would expect it to. It, it should be able to, in this case, emit at least a warning. Say that. Hey, you, this will always be in violation of the contract. There is no way this can work. It's still a valid program. It is a valid. It's, it's, a, it's a stupid program. It's a valid program, provided that you think that a call to terminate is valid. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't have undefined behavior, so in that sense, it's absolutely correct. Yeah, but uh, so we can see this. It's the same for all functions. They, they, the contract checks are done, but both the preconditions and the postconditions are done inside <coughs> the function body. And that is, that is interesting. And that, that will actually get more interesting as we move forward into more, what, more details about uh, how this works. Wow, I see, wow, I look at the time and I see that we, you have been a way too good audience. I'm, I'm not going to finish on time. So, police and contract. Yay, lots of contract text. Translation may be performed with one of the following levels, off, default, or audit. A translation with build level off performs no checking. With default, performs checking of default contracts, and with audit, performs checking for default and audit contracts. And axiom are never checked. The mechanism for selecting the build level is implementation defined. The translation of a program consisting of several translation units where the build level is not the same is conditionally supported. What on earth does that mean? So it means that it's not required to be supported by the compiler. But if they're not supporting it, they better document that it's not supported. This is problematic. Yes. There should be no programmatic way of setting modifier or querying the build level of a translation unit. So you cannot change this from within the program itself. This thing with the different uh, translation units with different levels is interesting since we know that the contracts are checked within a function. This means that if you make a call from a translation unit with checking off to a function implemented in a translation unit compiled with audit, then it will be audited, it will be checked, and it will have the consequences it will have. So, shall we have a look at this? Uh, the way it is done, where there is a, a Clang has a flag build level. So we can go back to this one. We can add a you can say audit. And nothing much happens because I haven't well then now we have sort of everything, but if we we can add some. We say that this, we, we don't want to check this always. We say that this one is audit, that one is audit. If we go back to default, what we now see is that some things are a little bit easier. If we, if we look at, yeah, we we see that it has now been able to remove some of the functions like uh, bottom and top. We can do the same for this one. Ah. <coughs> mm. 
now we see that the, now the constructor doesn't do anything. Whereas if we go back to what is missing? No. OK, um, I ran out of battery. Sorry, it was low battery. Um, so now with audit, we can see where, that we have the checks back. And we can say it, set it to off and no, no calls to, to check any conditions. So that, that's really all there is to that. If you ship libraries, are they supposed to be with contracts on or off? It's up to you. So same as usual. Do, do, do you ship them with um, a search? It's up to you. Yeah, but uh, you have a clause in the standard now that if there's a difference what you compile with the user and the yes. Yeah, the, the, that is a, the thing. It, presumably, you know what compiler you are delivering your library for. Yeah. So you know what the, what the compiler supports. Because if you have two libraries, yeah. one is using contracts, one is compiled with contracts. Yeah. 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 And yeah. what should you choose unless your compiler supports it? It's not easy. What should you choose if you, if you deliver a library that you know that the only compiler supported for this platform is one that doesn't support mixed, uh, mixed checking. Um, sorry, your problem. It's, uh, yeah, the, 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 yeah the, the solution is to, to don't do a binary deliveries. So yeah, <laughs> send it as source. You should ship free version for debug and free version for release. Yeah. Uh, OK. When contracts are violated, what should happen then? Well, you saw that terminate is called. Uh, a lot of standard text again. The violation handler of a program is a function that takes an L value reference to a contract violation and returns void. A contract violation is a very simple struct that looks like this. It, it, it can, you can get line number, file name, function name, comment, and assertion level. And that's it. The violation handler is invoked when the predicate of a checked contract evaluates to false. That is a contract violation. There should be no programmatic way of setting or modifying the contract handler. If a precondition is violated, the source location is implementation defined. Oh. Note, implementations are encouraged but not required to report the call site. Hmm. Interesting. Let's have a look again. So we can call with a contract violation handler function. Yeah. But now I can declare a special like audit level contract. Yeah, but you cannot I can specify what the level is from the when building it, but I cannot programmatically find out what it is. And I cannot programmatically change it. I think it's saying that if you use the you um, ensure that the audit handlers are executed in the correct order with different settings then depending off I can deduce what level it is from the handler. Yes, that is true. That, that is correct. But it's sort of too late. I, I have found out that I am in violation. I, 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 can, I cannot do anything proactively. Uh, so let's go to... The other one here is really the same. It's just that I have 
added this uh, contract violation handler flag. So I have a violation handler that just writes something. So we see the code for the violation handler, which is a, a lot of ugly stuff. Let's not go there. But what you can see, what is kind of interesting is that we don't see a heck of a lot of things to it. There is a table of violation handlers. So we can see that here, the built-in violation handler calls my violation handler, but from inside the, my code, it doesn't happen. Does the program violate after? Yes, it, vi it, it terminates after. Hold on. Can I add contracts to the violation? Can, sorry. Can I add contracts to the violation handler? Can you add contracts to the violation handler? Wow. <laughs> I presume that you can. I can only presume that you actually can. It's, it, since, the, since contracts are not part of the function signature, you can. It's probably an amazingly bad idea. <laughs> but, <laughs> but does the standard say anything about if a violation handle would pro, then you could deduce it by proing and caching? Yes, but what if you're violating a function that is uh, no accept? Then you're in terminate again. So. Uh, no, it, 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 it's not necessary, but it's a very good idea that uh, the uh, violation handler never throws, because if it throws in a violation of a function that is a no-accept function, then it's kind of bad. Just it said no-accept function. It said uh, no-accept optional. Oh. So it may be no-accept. Yeah, that, that, is, that is a sort of weasel of words used here. The violation handler for the program. Okay. So there's. So it's a linker thing. It's a, it seems like it's more a linker thing than, than a, a so compiler thing. So libraries should not have its own violation handler. Libraries should not have their own violation handler. That is definitely my interpretation of this, yes. Um, this can actually be a little bit easier to view. I have, it's the same program except that I'm streaming more information. And I have it in GDB here. So if we break in uh, my violation handler and run the program, we can uh, have a look here at what this uh, contract violation is. And we can see that it's, it says something about line 21 in t.cpp, which is here. So the, the standard says that it's implementation defined what the uh, location is when a precondition is violated, but it's encouraged to report the call site. This uh, implementation obviously doesn't follow the encouragement. So it's reporting where the contract is expressed, which is not very useful. And in my opinion, um, we see that the function is top. I would have at least hoped to see that it's ring buffer of int comma four colon colon top. There are probably a lot of functions named top. Hopefully not on that file and line, but still. Comment says what the expression is, and we see that the level is default. And if we continue, we can see that it, it, it prints this, and then afterwards we go to uh, terminate. It's not super obvious to me why this is more convenient than actually write this code yourself. Uh, it's not super obvious why you want to use this uh, functionality in the language instead of writing your own. Um, I agree, mostly, uh, not entirely. Uh, the thing is that by having this in the language, in the standard, there will be tool support for it. Your own handlers will not have tool support. I 
I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I, I agree. The runtime part is, uh, it's, it's not an obvious improvement. No, I, 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 would I agree. I it has value if it's translated to static asterisk in consecutive context. If it's yeah. not... Yeah, if it, okay, Mathieu's observation is that it, it's, it's really valuable if you get to effectively a static assert in, in context per context. But I think you would get that if you call... Uh, if you, if you use a, a normal assertion also, because you cannot call a cert from a, in, in context per context. So that should be a compilation yeah, error still. Yeah, but but with, with, with a little, yeah, yeah, than, than yeah. And uh, this, uh, this I, again, I, I don't know, sorry. Uh, I assume that that is the case, but I don't know it. Not a heck of a lot more to say. Uh, there is this. The translation may be, per, may be performed with uh, violation continuation mode of ROM. The translation with, con vi with violation continuation mode set to off terminates by calling to terminate, as we have seen, and that is the default. But you can set continuation mode to on, in which case it continues. I find this very disturbing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, you. So you have bothered. To, you're taking the expense to find out that your program is now in undefined behavior, and you can no longer reason about what we will do. But yeah, we will continue. The only thing we know with absolute certainty is that we will. We don't know what will happen. That is what we know. Maybe I don't trust that I got my contracts right. Yeah, and that is actually the, the, the note at the end here that I didn't bother to highlight, that if, if you're retrofitting contracts to existing code, that may be a, a way to get started. But in my opinion, it's probably better to be even more extreme and ensure that you get a core dump in a violation, because then you have access to all states and can see exactly what your program is in the situation where you violated it. So I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, the, the observation is if I'm making, say, a Mars lander, then I, I want to continue. No, I think probably you want to ensure that your program can restart clean. Because what you absolutely don't want to do is to corrupt its state and continue, because that is almost certainly going to create a crater. Uh, so there's just this example saying that it, here we have a simple contract, we're calling it an obvious violation. If the handler is the default, that is continuation mode off, then we call terminate, and otherwise we continue. I'm not super happy about this, but I'm sure people will find it extremely useful for something. And that's really all I had to say. So. In summary, we can say that design by contract is a way to clarify the responsibility between the function implementer and its, its caller. It's not watertight. We, we cannot express everything, but, but we can express a lot. And we can point to who is the guilty part, who, who is to blame, who done it. Language support is coming in 20. Well, is. The standard isn't fixed yet. Everything can happen, but I think it's pretty darn likely that it will come. But it's lacking, as you saw. We, had, we don't have class invariants. Post conditions cannot refer to pre-call state. And we have some really curious gotchas like uh, modifying parameter values and uh, template specializations. Actually, what the, I didn't expand on that. Uh, I mentioned that there is one paragraph that talks about specializations. And what it says is that a specialization is a completely new class. We have no opinion about its contract. It can be something, whatever. <laughs> so, yeah, be careful. 
Contracts can be used by static analysis tools, and I assume they can be used by the optimizer. I don't know this for sure, but since some compilers use a search to guide optimizations, I take that for granted. And there are configurable levels of uh, contracts in, uh, when you build. So, for example, full support with the super expensive stuff in, in debug builds or test builds or and only cheap ones in release or whatever. It, it's up to you. And you can play with it if you want to. And uh, maybe fix some other crashes. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Um, Paul. Is there any other implementation that a Clang one? N none that I know of. So you suggested uh, twice, once uh, that uh, it might be undefined behavior to violate the contract, and also you assume that the optimizer can take advantage of it. Yeah. Uh, I, I think this is a really interesting uh, sort of angle. Uh, can you implement something like restrict using this bus, using contract, or just like this in sign nature is not allowed to be negative? Two questions in there. Um, since we, since I, this is my personal in interpretation, that, that calling a function outside of contract is uh, more or less by definition undefined behavior and the compiler is allowed to, I think, take advantage of it. Can I, can I fake uh, a res the restrict keyword using contracts? I don't know, maybe. I'm, I'm not sure how to express that, but, but maybe. Uh, can I set a uh, contract that a, a signed integer may not be negative and the compiler can take advantage of it? That I take for granted, uh, but I don't know it for sure, but it, I really think so. Yeah, and uh, I'm going to very briefly repeat this for, uh, for the video. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, the observation is that the functionality that, that it offers is something we can do today. And uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, I've, I've been using contract, designed by contract in C++ for, I don't know, 15 years at least. Uh, but since we have it now, are getting it now as as a standardized feature in the language, this means that tools will be able to take advantage of it. The static ana analyzers will be able to tell us things that haven't been able to tell us. IDEs will be able to tell us things. And that is huge. It, w it will mean a lot when we get these. Did I sort of get it right? Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Technically, what uh, prevents compilers from just uh, doing the same with the uh, certs? 
What prevents the compilers from doing the same as the asserts? Uh, um, you can turn it around and say there is nothing preventing a compiler from implementing the assert macro in terms of uh, these uh, contracts. Um. Is there any particular organization or group that uh, been the advocate of uh, contracts? Has there been some, any special group that's been advocating contracts? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it has been discussed for quite some time. Uh, Mathieu, do, do you have yeah, some? Uh, probably Bloomberg, uh, because John Lagos is there. Oh. And John Lagos has been talking about contracts for like 20 years. Oh. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure it was in the one of the original papers. Oh. Yeah, the, the Matthias observation is uh, almost certainly Bloomberg since, since uh, John Lycos uh, has been talking about this for many, many, many years. So, yeah. This might be outside the scope of this talk, but is there any other language which, which does this uh, in, a more, in a way that you like better? I introduced uh, Eiffel in the <laughs> very first few slides. So that is a language that that has ha had this support from uh, from day one, and it's uh, it has better support. But it's also uh, I, I think many of the reasons why it looks the way it does is this uh, fear of adding extra costs. So some of the th some functionality like uh, automatic generation of really good uh, class invariants is probably going to cost a lot, I think. I'm not sure. Uh, and I think that's why it's not there. I also think that what we're seeing now is a first step. I think there will be more. I think this will grow in, in future versions of the language. I, I don't think this is the, the final thing. Uh, has it been voted in yet, or is it a proposal? It is, has been voted in yet. It, it has been voted in uh, since... Uh, I, I think it was voted in... Uh, was it in San Francisco? Or, uh, San, San Diego, sorry. San Diego. Uh, I think it was voted in, in San Diego. My question is that your, your talk was a lot about objects and some methods. Yeah. But can we put contracts on functions in languages? Can I put contracts on functions? Yes. Definitely. A uh, lambdas, I don't know. I have to check that. If you put a contract on a function, could it have a contract on a global variable? Can you have a contract on a global variable? Yes, you can have a contract saying what the next value of random must be. It's a super bad contract, but you can. <laughs> oh, so you can deny There is no check that the function you pull in your, uh, in your contract has a side effect, or not even is constant. Uh, there is no check that the, uh, th that the function does not have side effects. Uh, I think it says that it's undefined if you do have side effects, okay. so, so don't go there. there. But like yeah. Your, uh, yeah, so yeah. I, I, I don't remember exactly. Um, I think that is what it says. Or, or, so, the, the question is, are contracts in conflict with the generic code? Um, yes and no. It, it depends. You have to think a little bit about what parts of the contract are truly generic. Like, like in this ring bar, for example. I, I think that is, what I wrote in that is generic. With the exception, uh, as was noted by some in the audience, about uh, what the value of top is after push because it depends on the parameter type. But if you remove that one, I think it's, uh, that is truly generic. Uh, but it's easy to make a mistake and say that, for example, yeah, the, this template parameter must be greater than zero, but maybe it's instantiable with something that is not comparable with an integer. Yeah. Bad contract. So you have to think a little bit more carefully. All right. Out of time, thank you.